It's a, a, a very heavy topic, and um, many times I've spent <laughs> many hours with, with Charlotte and uh, heard her passion. Uh, even yesterday, as we were preparing these PowerPoints, uh, we were going through the, the same kind of emotions and uh, the, the deep injustice of what has happened that uh, Charlotte and others have experienced uh, so in such a raw and, and painful way. So, in a sense, the, the Congo is an incredibly rich, rich country. We've heard this in time tonight. But uh, it, it is also a, a curse as, as well as a blessing. And that has, has drawn the attention of many nations. So, uh, the uranium for the Hiroshima uh, bomb uh, that was dropped <coughs> in Japan uh, came from, from the Congo. There are many uh, things that the West uses that developed nations in the world use, uh, which come from the Congo. And the, the Congolese people themselves are not getting such a, a, a good deal out of it. Their GDP, I think, is something in the region of uh, 31 billion. And uh, most of the, the population is living below the poverty line. Fidel, before, mentioned that people are just scrambling around trying to survive most of the time, trying to find food and trying to eat and trying to find create a living for themselves and maintain a living for themselves, that it's very difficult to do something about changing the government or working in, in a political way to, to change the country. So, in a sense, the international community has many people, many actors working in Congo, a number of them are quite self-centered and quite greedy, avaricious. So they work together also with people within the Congo who are also greedy and avaricious and, and they don't have a sense of, of humanity for the rest of the, of the people of the nation. Uh, it was interesting, one, one uh, uh, political group, they, uh, they asked me to, to teach good governance to, to their, their people within their, their political group. And it was very interesting uh, doing that. And the, the fact that it was, was called for, or asked for, but just to, to teach how a political system works and uh, how simple uh, acts of, of developing uh, uh, models of patriotism and people who have been heroes and heroines to create a culture whereby those people are praised and uh, elevated within the societies is actually seen as something maybe not so well known or, or not so active. But actually it's, it's really needed to create a, a, a spirit of patriotism whereby people are patriotic in living for the nation, living for the wider community and for their nation. But then the nation takes care of those people. So there should be this uh, harmonious relationship uh, which exists in, to a, a greater or lesser degree in certain countries, but this relationship is completely skewed. So good people, NGOs, uh, people of conscience, journalists, from the wider world, in a sense, have to cooperate with diaspora and with, uh, with people within the, the DRC to help them to raise these issues and work to, uh, to find justice for the, uh, the Congolese people. So having a, a network and a way to raise those issues that come of abuse within, within Congo, abuse which sometimes or quite often comes from our own multinationals, then uh, this is a, a, an active role that people uh, in other countries in the wider world can play. So, so uh, why why are we concerned? We are concerned because we are consumers. 
we are people who are consuming, and when we're consuming, there is a choice. Involved in a choice, there is a moral responsibility. So whatever we consume, we have a choice. We can buy from one brand or another. And of course, it takes time to, to find out what is behind a particular brand. But when uh, Rana Plaza uh, building collapsed in, in Bangladesh, we suddenly realized that so many of our clothes were being produced in such terrible circumstances. Uh, and we realized that Primark or Matalans and others, other places that we buy from were, were using them. And some people decided not to use those brands anymore. So we have a choice. And uh, of course, it's very difficult to perform well, given our economies. In, without mobile phones or laptops and so on. And, uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do, but actually we have to put pressure on our, our com the companies we buy from and also the, the countries that we live in. We have to put pressure on them to, to uh, have legislation and active uh, regulation of the type of minerals that are used in the products that we consume. This is why we are concerned and why we also put effort on certain issues about conflict minerals. So, can we... so one role that NGOs can play, I'll come to the uh, conflict minerals a little bit later, but one role that uh, NGOs can play, we can facilitate. We can't be experts in, in many issues, so certain NGOs have competency and expertise in a particular area. Or we can facilitate it, create a platform. So one of the best things that I could do is not me get up here and speak so much about the, the passion of the situation, but it's giving a platform to someone like Charlotte to come in and speak. So we've had a, so many times when she was able to move the heart of, of various uh, politicians, journalists, and uh, NGOs, MEPs, uh, when we, we had her come and speak. This way, uh, we can facilitate and we can give a platform to raise awareness. Our weakness as an NGO, of course, one time, uh, uh, I'm so grateful for, De for Fidel for his also his righteous kind of, uh, and very dangerous uh, life of raising these issues in Goma. Also, his Fidel's life has been threatened. And he's had to be very, very careful sometimes. But he keeps on campaigning because he sees so much injustice. Uh, one time we had Fidel also uh, by Skype in the European Parliament, which was great because we could get directly information from, from Goma into the European Parliament to people who were considering legislation on conflict minerals. What is the weakness of NGOs is actually we are distant. Someone like myself, I've never visited the DRC, so therefore I don't know what's it like to be there, and I don't know firsthand what's going on. So we rely on people like Fidel to inform what is, is happening. Or we rely on, on Charlotte to, to come and give that, that information. But we can be, the NGOs can be very blunt or inaccurate or ineffective in some of the issues we highlight, in some of the ways that we highlight uh, those campaigns. So we have to be particularly careful that the kinds of campaigns that we do are effective and they are, are also connected to the people on the ground. Uh, who have very first-hand awareness of how those campaigns affect people who are trying to earn a, a living in those countries. Uh, so, various uh, levers that, that we can have, of course, is by getting information, either from uh, the diaspora here in, in Europe or in the UK, who are, are in touch with people in DRC, but also from people that we know, and people that we're in touch with ourselves. That we can act on them, we can make newsletters, we can use the networks we have to
to raise awareness of those issues. We can have uh, events where we can inform people through those, those programs. We can invite journalists or to come, and also journalists who have been there. Like uh, Humphrey Hawksey has been very, very useful as an advisor for various campaigns. He's also someone who introduced us to, to Fidel, because he met Fidel when he went to Goma. Humphrey Hawksey, as a BBC journalist, has done two documentaries on, on the DRC. Uh, another one is, is using uh, the UN uh, uh, business human rights uh, conventions. So therefore, they have a set of principles to which uh, countries have, have signed up, and also businesses have signed up. But uh, for countries, they, we have a national uh, contact person in the Foreign Office. If we hear that UK uh, businesses are misbehaving or not keeping human rights standards, not uh, really treating labor within the DRC well, well, they're using child labor, for example, then we can report them uh, to the national con contact person. Think so. so by uh, meeting people, we could learn of their struggles and their difficulties. So Charlotte introduced uh, me to, to Dr. Uh, Dennis McQuaidy, who you've seen before. But when his, his accounts were closed down by the government, I think it was last year, then we could all campaign, we could all start informing people that we knew about uh, this issue so that they could raise it and use it in, in a typical way by informing the all party parliamentary group for the Great Lakes and working with very, various contacts we have in Parliament. So this way we could take various uh, problems that were going on, that we were informed about, and try to to do our, our bit from our end. Next bit. Sorry. This is in the, the European Parliament where Charlotte and Humphrey Hawksey spoke and, and with others. We were hosted by Charles Tannock, who's the MEP for London. And again. And again, uh, when there was a consultation period on conflict minerals, and we also had an event in the European Parliament, again using the same networks. And, by uh, using Humphrey and at that time uh, Fidel spoke and also the deputy minister I think for mines uh, for I think it was for South Kivu uh, he also spoke next one and uh, another event where we've talked about these issues again and again this person was quite amazingly brave he's a whistleblower so he was auditing uh, the Kaloti uh, Dubai uh, smelter, a smelting uh, company. And he realized that a lot of, of trade was going on in cash. Up to 40% of the trade in gold was happening in cash. And he realized that that was very dangerous for allowing uh, conflict minerals to be traded and uh, in a sense laundered through this, this smelter. When he realized that his findings weren't going to be announced, uh, then he, he left the company. He was a partner, so actually he was really well advanced uh, for a very young, kind of talented person. He was 37 years old, he became one of the youngest partners of Ernst & Young. He gave that up uh, to announce what, what had happened. Uh, you can still see his, his testimony on YouTube and in The Guardian. So there is a, a real trade, particularly in gold, which uh, is much easier to transport, to melt down, to, to carry. Uh, it's much easier to, uh, to trade in conflict uh, gold and other, other conflict minerals. The uh, Dodd-Frank law is is uh, included a clause uh, 1502, which then stipulated that uh, companies should do due diligence that they do not have conflict minerals from the DRC uh, in their supply chain. 
and that, that has been a, a source of, of great tension. So the Stock Exchange Commission were uh, set out to, to or told to regulate this, and for the last few years they've been setting it up, and there have been uh, there's one year of reporting. I think this is either second or third year of reporting, but uh, it's also been going through the courts, and it it might uh, be very much weakened by uh, legal action. We uh, will find out in the near future. Also, the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, has its guiding principles on conflict minerals. And again. And again. The uh, European Parliament also uh, first seemed to be taking a very weak kind of response uh, to conflict minerals and wanted uh, importers to opt in as to whether they their, uh, since their reputation would be enhanced by proving that they were, were conflict-free in the use of their minerals. But uh, it was free to, to opt out if you, if you didn't want to. There are some very, very good companies that are doing very good work, uh, but it's very likely that many would just, just ignore. But later on, through pressure, particularly I think Global Witness, they did a, a lot of good work enough, uh, also did a lot of good work. Uh, and there was a, a lot of lobbying of MEPs, and they came up with a much tougher uh, set of regulations that all, all European importers of uh, minerals had to do due diligence that their minerals did, uh, did not come from conflict affected areas, or areas of high risk of, of conflict, where those minerals would, would be fueling the conflict. And this now, since it's going through the negotiations with member states as to whether uh, they'll keep to this very strict standard, which is much more strict than the Dodd-Frank law, or uh, whether it be diluted. Unfortunately, it's, there is some news that in these negotiations, the much more diluted uh, regulation will come out, but it's yet to be announced. In the UK, we have a number of uh, very local uh, associations, in gold and tin, uh, very, uh, in London or in St. Albans, very, very close by. There is a number of these organizations that are supposed to monitor also the, the use of conflict minerals. We are also how am I doing today? We also have uh, these UN uh, guiding principles on business human rights, which have been set up uh, particularly September two thousand thirteen. From that stage, they have been set up in the UK. The UK was one of the first to to sign up to them, but a number of countries also have signed up to them. So. Uh, we have a, a way, if we hear that a multinational that is registered on the, the London Stock Exchange, we, we have a, a lever to pull. And in the, the case of uh, Virunga recently, uh, where there was the threat to, to extract oil from a UNESCO heritage site, then there was pressure from the, the UK government on, on the companies involved. This, this is one way that we can also work with the, the conflict minerals issue and other issues of, of injustice by UK-based multinationals. So these are a set of 10 principles that are part of these guiding, uh, guiding principles, but also that uh, companies that want to be, have the, the UN logo and the, the logo of the, the UN Business uh, Global Compact, they, if they want to, they need to sign up to these principles. So for environment, for anti-corruption, for labor, for human rights. Okay. This is the, the uh, national contact point. You can find it on the Foreign Office website. And there's a, a growing uh, case law uh, around it. 
and it is uh, something that you know we've we've discussed before when we thought about how to to highlight the actions of, of certain uh, multinationals in the DRC, which is not uh, really not helping the development of the DRC and uh, fulfilling its potential. Positive science. There is a, a fair phone. Uh, one of our, our colleagues has one. He had to, to book it and then wait. I think he had to wait for, for a, a five or six weeks until it was sent to him. So they do it in batches from Holland. But this is guaranteed not to have any conflict minerals. And uh, its second version is called Fairphone 2. It's a modular version. So it's not one that you use for two years and then discard and you get an upgrade. This is one where you can take out different modules when a new one comes up and then you can uh, put it together yourself. So you can keep it for many years this way. But uh, you can look it up, uh, Fairphone, it's, it does it in batches so you have to book and then and it will come. I want to say one other thing about there's a, Philips particularly did a lot of good work in setting up a, a pipeline. They themselves said, you know, this is extremely fragile. But they set up a, a pipeline which was protected from militias. So they worked from the, the mine uh, to the exporter and guaranteed and also had people who would, who would uh, whistleblow if something was, was corrupted. Uh, they, they set up a pipeline with a lot of, of hard work. But they, interestingly, through that pipeline and through that guaranteed uh, export structure, the actual miners got three times as much for their product. Amazing. One of the dangers of, of uh, Dodd-Frank and others is that companies will just say, look, forget it, you know, this is too complex. I, I just I can't deal it, I'll just get the minerals some, somewhere else. And therefore, miners in the DRC who are, who are desperate to make a living can't make, can't make a living because there's no one to export to. So having some structures and some pipelines, as we call them, whereby there is a guaranteed uh, ex uh, mine to exporter system is very valuable for the artisanal miner, which uh, makes up a large proportion of the, uh, the DRC mining. So that's uh, what I want to say. In a sense, it's a, a compliment to, to the others in that I'm not talking so much about rape and the, the, the terrible circumstances, but looking at the structures that are, are supporting that and how we can work in the West to to blunt it, to, to support the good people within the, the DRC or campaigning hard to, to change their circumstances. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. And um, it's uh, an interesting approach uh, that an NGO has taken of uh, uh, looking at issues and engaging with various stakeholders. So whether it's sort of giving lectures on good governance, whether it's providing the platform for Charlotte, um, uh, and uh, engaging and lobbying um, as constructive uh, approaches of dealing with this um, problematic issue. And it was, uh, thank you, uh, Robin, for bringing in the emerging norms around business and human rights as well. Those are quite enormous, uh, very important. They don't have teeth or um, uh, legitimacy in the sense that they do have legitimacy, they were um, adopted by the Human Rights Council unanimously by the states there. Um, they, what I'm seeing in my practice of this is that companies are volunteering. Usually there's an allegation or an issue that starts um, and then they uh, look to sort of adhere uh, and, and, and find ways of compliance. So these mechanisms are making a difference, but I suppose the question is, are they making a difference fast enough for, for, for what's going on in the DRC?